Good morning. Uh, my name is Dr. Alan Lumsden. I'm the medical director for the Houston Methodist DeBakey Heart and Vascular Center. And we want to welcome you to another edition of DeBakey CV Live. And this time we're going to focus on something that's highly topical at the moment, and that is ECMO and the coronavirus. Let me introduce you to uh, the folks who are going to participate in this this morning uh, because I'm the least important person, probably have least knowledge about this. And so for that reason, I'm going to hand this over to my partner here, Dr. Tom McGilvery, who is the Chief of Cardiac Surgery and Thoracic Transplantation. Uh, with me also on the podium is Dr. Eddie Suarez, who's kind of on the pointy end of this uh, spear and is heavily involved in taking care of the patients uh, with uh, ECMO. We'll be joined by a number of other people this morning. Uh, uh, joining us is actually Joe Basha. He's the CEO of Houston Extracorporeal Technologies. Uh, one of the reasons he's doing this is because of his interest in cardiovascular education around perfusion, and he runs Perfusion Web. We're also going to hear from Dr. Faisal Masood, Dr. Gil Ford, and Lena Sue, who's our ECMO specialist. So with that, Tom, I think it's a real important topic to address. Uh, the caveat is none of us are experts. I think we've got experts up here on ECMO, but none of us would claim to be experts in ECMO and dealing with the COVID-19 patients. So that's one of the reasons we want to basically talk about early learning experiences. And so with that, Tom, I'm going to hand the show over to you uh, and let you moderate the session. Thank you very much for doing this. Thanks, Alan. Good morning, everybody. And thank you very much, Alan, for putting this together. This is probably the most important crisis medically of our time, uh, not since the Spanish flu has the world faced such a, uh, a, a dire situation. And uh, I hope that in the last hundred years that we've learned a lot that will help us help our patients. Uh, and specifically this morning, talk about what the role of ECMO will be in, in helping us prepare uh, and care for our patients. So uh, Eddie, uh, uh, there, the limited, there has been limited experience around the world and across the country for ECMO uh, in caring for patients with COVID-19. Can you, can you elaborate on that so a bit? It's been difficult. To, that's the one reason we wanted to do this. We've been trying to uh, search around to find out what other people's experiences are. There's not very much that's been published and a lot of this has been going on our social media apps, WhatsApp groups, also put on a nice uh, um, webcast just a few days ago, uh, going through different people's experiences in, in Singapore, and we heard there that the Korea and J Japan have had more experience than, than China and, and, and Italy, and we'll hopefully be hearing about, about their uh, experiences published sometime soon. Uh, just through our social media, we know we've, we've read that there are over at least 20 people who are in ECMO around, around the country right now. Uh, several in, in multiple New York in the double digits. We know Cornell has experience, Columbia has experience, NYU as well. We, we've had our, our, our patient who's been on the ECMO, talking to my colleagues next door, I know they've had someone in Dallas, someone in, in, uh, in just next door at, at St. Luke's who, who is COVID positive as well. And we're all trying to kind of aggregate our, our, our experience so we can kind of give, uh, give some, some guidance to the people who, are, who still have to see it and who have to set it up because we did have some challenges kind of initially starting our program. We had to start our ECMO program in a new unit, the MICU. Right now our ECMO program, as you know, is set up for the cardiovascular ICU. We've never done ECMO outside of that cardiovascular ICU. Yeah. And early on the decision was made to, I think appropriately, to, to try to segregate the, um, and quarantine the COVID patients into the MICU to start right there. So, so we'll get, we'll get into the nuts and bolts of yeah. uh, exactly yeah. how you do it and uh, how you should do it yeah. in, in a few minutes. But uh, so, yeah. so where it all began in, in China, yeah. there, there has been, I mean, they had a huge number of patients yeah. that uh, were infected and affected by the, uh, by the virus. And that um, there was a relatively, at least the reports coming out of China is the number of patients who required ECMO yeah was relatively small yes. and the outcomes that we know were not that great. The ones that were published, absolutely. Uh, yeah. the, the Korean experience, uh, at least at last count, uh, about 30 patients had been put on ECMO, mm -hmm. uh, half VV ECMO mm -hmm. and half VA ECMO. Yeah. And, and we'll talk about the specifics uh, together uh, yeah. shortly. Yeah. Uh, I'd like to introduce Gil Ford. Gil is our uh, chief perfusionist here at Houston Methodist. Uh, he has extensive experience with uh, cardiopulmonary bypass and with uh, ECMO, 
And uh, I would say, in addition to being an expert clinician, he's now our ECMO quartermaster uh, as, uh, as well. So I mean, uh, yeah. just briefly, I mean, there, there is, even though we don't have much experience with ECMO, with COVID-19, I mean, ECMO has a very big experience going over the last 40 years with yeah. patients with ARDS. Yeah. Um, and that, uh, Eddie, can you talk about what the experience with ARDS has been uh, with, uh, with ECMO? We, as you know, like there have been a few trials this season and, and uh, ELOIA trials that, that, that have shown some, some modest increase. But it just uh, talking to people, I mean, with, with our personal experience and everyone else's, it, it is, especially in viral pneumonia, known to be a, have better outcomes than, than most other indications. People who do have viral pneumonia right now, at least our institution, we expect them to, to get better for, from other viral pneumonias if they have a, a flu or, or something else that, that causes some sort of ARDS. An acute reversible cause of the ARDS, th those are the ones who we, we think usually have the, the best potential benefit uh, out of uh, support because the bodies usually recover out of, out of the acute phase and once the lung injury is improved, they can usually come off ECMO and, and, uh, and hopefully go on to leave a meaningful life. So, the, so, the, so at least from what we know so far, and again, we're, I certainly am not yeah. a content expert about COVID-19, but my understanding is that the vast majority of patients who contract the disease have a mild case. Yeah. About 20 to 30 percent will need to be hospitalized, and, and of those, there is a, uh, a, a, a pretty significant number yeah. that end up going into the ICU. Depends on where you go, but th th it's up to about a, a quarter of those as well go into the ICU. Right. Yeah. And so, so far the mainstay, the mainstay of treatment is ventilatory management. Yes. Uh, and all of the different uh, uh, methods that have been developed mm -hmm. for that are, are thought to be so far pretty effective in the patients who have recovered. So what, what should be the indications of Going on, uh, going on ECMO. So for us, we've been using the same indication we used for all our other lung injury patients requiring uh, venovenous support right now. For the ones who just have lung injury, not the ones who have obviously a cardio cardiac involvement as well. So can you go, can you detail what those the, indications the, are? The main ones are basic. In generally, it's basic patients who are on almost maximal ventilatory support. Uh, without contraindications. There are different people who use different scoring systems to decide whether, whether someone is a, a candidate. The mo one of the more, more popular ones that people discuss is the, the RESP score, the RESP score, that, that takes into account things like people's age, uh, need for nitric oxide, whether they've been on paralytics, uh, what the etiology of, of their pneumonia is, that, that's an uh, excellent scoring system used, used pretty routinely. We end up using a SOFA score to, to kind of help determine what we think people's outcomes is going to be. Um, but we also, uh, bes besides that, we, we look at obviously contraindications. And we've been using the same contraindications that everyone else ha has been. Uh, people are talking, we, we know around the, the world, uh, about advanced age. As, as being something that, that people who are older w with COVID seem to not do as well as, especially on ECMO, as people who are younger. Yeah. So, I mean, it, it's a little bit of a, of a change in how we care for patients. I mean, yeah. usually uh, in this modern age, we have the ability to use a tremendous amount of resources for yeah. individual patients. Uh, we're faced now with a huge, potentially a huge number of patients that will require a lot of resources. And we'll yeah. talk about resources and resource management with Gil in a second. But uh, so, so as it's evolving, I mean, are there some patients who we would recommend should not go on ECMO? Uh, that, that's, well, the, we're using our standard criteria right now. And I think most people, you, people know how to put people on VV ECMO and for respiratory viral illnesses. People have their protocols and their algorithms and people are kind of trying to figure out what's different with coronavirus. And for the most part, I, I think it is the, the, uh, very similar to, to other ideologies, with the exception of, of age. Yeah. Uh, that seems, some people seem to have realized, you know, the older people are, the, the, the more uh, unlikely they do well. Other comorbidities- but, but we're not talking about 90-year-olds. We're talking yeah, about- uh, Like over, over, some people are looking over 60 as, yeah. as being too high, which, which before we-, we That doesn't seem very old to me right now. <laughs> which we definitely would have considered before. Yeah. And uh, whether we should can't have an absolute cutoff is something people discuss. We've been discussing with our colleagues. I still think we need to look at people's uh, um, comorbidity. Obviously, people look at their comorbidities and, and uh, at their physiological age, not just their, 
the yeah. numer numeric age, but it, it's their decisions are going to have to be made. How about how about so I mean the if there is an ideal patient, it's a patient that's Younger, ARDS. Just single organ. Single organ. Uh, ARDS, single organ, just lung involvement, no other, no other uh, um, organ involvement on requiring maximal ventilatory support. For me, it's as if someone is consistently on FiO2 greater than 60% for like more than a, a couple, a day or two, that's someone that who's getting lung, lung injury from the ventilator itself and trying to kind of uh, offload the strain on the lungs to help the lung recovery is, is what I look for, for for someone who may benefit from ECMO. But it, se it seems like the experience so far has been people go about a week after presenting with fevers and cough to getting short of breath and then it's a very rapid decline Absolutely. from becoming short of breath to needing to be intubated to accelerating the amount of support on the ventilator towards if, if indicated, going on ECMO. Our, our patient, uh, we, we're going to question to expect these patients to be tertiary care centers around the community. We'll get to that in a second, but uh, just so you yeah, have the patient that we experience, and it sounds like it's uh, similar around, around the nation and country and world, is that people do, do deteriorate very, very quickly. Our, our patient was intubated and ta uh, well, was talking on a Sunday, got intubated and on ECMO within two days. So, so it was a very rapid deterioration. And so these people expect them to be in tertiary care centers around the community. Uh, the question is, do you expect these patients to be in tertiary care centers around the community? And we have been getting, obviously, referrals fr from the community. And uh, my advice that we're learning is once you think that someone's going to need mechanical ventilation to get them to a tertiary care center as, as soon as you can, if possible, right now, while we're not overloaded, because they may need and a stupendous amount of resources to, to help support that we're realizing. And coordination of the care and allocation of the resources is going to be everything. So coordination and resources are a very important topic. So Gil, I mean, it, yeah. it, it takes equipment, it takes uh, a team of experts, and it takes the coordination of those resources and a team of experts. Can you, can you talk about that for us? Absolutely. As far as the resources, that's probably going to be one of the biggest challenges, especially for new centers that are looking to put patients on ECMO. Because right now there's a national shortage as far as oxygenators. Uh, you know, all established centers are already working to buy those supplies up just to make sure they're prepared for the, for the potential ECMO surge. Uh, same thing, same thing with uh, bodies. Uh, as far as perfusionists, we're still in the middle of a national shortage as far as uh, uh, staff who can actually sit and operate the machine. In that situation, you have to think outside the box, you know, potentially bring in ECMO specialists or potentially trained nurses who can help us out in that regards. Uh, one of the biggest recommendations that I would make as far as supplies is making sure that you have a continuous order out there in the system so as they allocate supplies to hospitals, you can get those in. So Gil, can you, can you uh, tell those listening, I mean, what are the specific kinds of ECMO pumps, circuits, and uh, oxygenators that are available? Uh, absolutely. So, uh, I mean, one of some of the most common, commonly used would be the uh, setting up a Centromag ECMO, uh, Quadrox ECMO, Cardio Help. Uh, you also have a tandem ECMO circuit. Uh, during this time, you, uh, centers are going to have to utilize whatever resources are available. Uh, there are oxygeners that we use for heart-lung machines, although they're not ideal for this situation for long-term use. We may have to even incorporate those at this point just because of the shortage of supplies. Uh, to go along with the ox not just the oxygenators, you have to also take into account tubing and all the components needed just to put the circuit together. Uh, right now, of course, there, as far as tubing goes, there's no manufacturing issues, but as the situation progresses and things get worse, we don't know how we'll still be able to get those supplies in, delivery. Uh, so stocking up right now while we're not in the peak, while we still haven't hit the peak is a good time for any center to try to take advantage of what you can get. So, so it's important to keep track of what supplies that you have, uh, what supplies are in use, and what supplies are gonna be needed. Would you say that's? Absolutely, that's absolutely. Yeah. Uh, keeping, uh, for instance, for us, we, you know, we keep a daily, uh, daily log of what we have on inventory. We have a daily log of what's coming in. Uh, you really, at this point, we really have to stay on top, stay on top of everything because, uh, like I said, if these patients start coming in, it's going to be instantaneous. I mean, we're going to be throwing them on. You want to make sure you always have backup equipment in-house, uh, change-outs. Uh, so it's not just making sure you have enough to put these patients on, but what do you have to, in case you have an equipment failure or an oxygenator failure, you really, you really have to ramp up, ramp up inventory right now.
So we, we uh, as uh, Eddie said, that uh, the situation now is different from the way we usually do things. Mm. Uh, and, and so uh, who makes up the team and how do you get the equipment from where it usually is to where it, it needs to be? And, and, and how do you get prepared for taking care of the patient, but at the same time taking care of the team so they stay safe? Yeah, so there's multiple components to the team. We have the ECMO specialists, we have the perfusionists who are responsible for uh, initiating, for change outs, troubleshooting. Uh, I mean, of course, our ECMO specialists are fantastic as well. They handle troubleshooting bedside, uh, call us down only when need be. Uh, you also have to think about the ECMO nurse, because uh, of course you have to have a way to break these individuals. Uh, when that time comes, you have a nurse who could sit there for a couple minutes and keep track of the patient while you may potentially have to step away. Uh, typically, most, most large centers don't take care of ECMO patients one-to-one. -one. Typically, it's more of a four-to-one ratio. So, you know, you, and you're allowed to have that ratio usually because you have other experienced staff members who can look in and, and help you out in that situation. Um, so I'd like, to, I'd like to bring it, we, we have uh, Joe Basha. Yeah. Uh, and we have Lena Sue with us uh, by Telecast. Joe is a perfusionist uh, by training uh, and uh, is very actively involved with uh, not just perfusion but uh, ECMO programs uh, uh, around the uh, greater Houston uh, area and has a lot of experience. And Lena is an ECMO specialist uh, in our ICU and has an extraordinary amount of experience caring for patients uh, on ECMO. So, uh, Joe, what, what are your thoughts about equipment and deployment of teams and management of these patients in terms of initiation uh, of ECMO? Yes, sir. Uh, that, those are great questions, and I actually appreciate everyone's perspective. Uh, often in this hallway, uh, Dr. Gilbert, Dr. Sparta's, and uh, Gail, an expert on communication behavior. Um, certainly, it is a, a big problem, and for us, uh, the major concern, of course, is we have to keep our staff uh, safe and healthy because uh, there are limited trained personnel to do what Caleb and I do, which uh, is the future, and that's the start with. Um, as far as equipment is concerned, I, I, I felt very good about all of those comments in what your current planning, uh, uh, what your current plans are. However, and with that said, he also mentioned there are already shortages. Uh, the community hospitals, of course, could easily be overwhelmed. Um, and centralization does make sense, except that then eventually you become overwhelmed and the amount of resources uh, just are just not there for everyone. So patient selection, chances for recovery, everything that Dr. Suarez talked about um, is absolutely going to be essential if we get to a point where we are just absolutely running out of everything that we need, including that space and all resources, whether it be equipment or otherwise. I think that for me, this brings up the larger question, and I'm so glad Lena is here because I have advocated for, for many years now, blended programs uh, for equity. There are only so many perfusionists. I think perfusionists are excellent clinicians at uh, maybe initiating uh, or managing more difficult patients and requires a, uh, a lot of adjustments in the Eyes, but a well trained technical specialist um, is also, especially with some long experience, more than capable of those things. And those that maybe aren't as experienced with a perfusionist as backup support would be, uh, or, or assistance would be uh, very important. And of course, it's not like I ask them for this being able to uh, have patience or minimize. So, Joe. Joe, you, uh, th those, you bring up some very good points. We have some questions coming in that we want to get to. Sure. You, you know, I think that, that at least in the past, we have gone to centralization for the use of these somewhat limited resources. And, and it may be that we're going to have to go from centralization to coordination uh, from a, a hub and spoke kind of system. We, we have Lena, I'd like to get you involved. Lena is a 
an expert, as I mentioned, in taking care of patients on, uh, on ECMO. Lena, can, can you give us some of your experience in general for taking care of ECMO patients and, and the experience you've had so far with the COVID-19 patient? Yeah. Um, first of all, I would like to thank you for having me in here in this conference. Um, I just want to let you know that my background is a registered nurse and um, before I move on to ECMO specialist, I've um, been doing this for almost three years. Um, recently, we put in an ECMO on uh, a COVID-19 patient. Um, is is a um, pretty challenge because we try to limit the exposure uh, of everyone to get into the room. So we come up with a plan that is just uh, Dr. Suarez, the PAB, um, me, the primary nurse, as well as Gail, the profusions to go in there. So we kind of limit uh, people to be in there to help out. So um, my position is to, um, of course, help um, uh, Gail if he needs me. And uh, with my background of as a registered nurse, I also can able to help um, the nurse as well. So um, it, it's been very smooth when we put in the VV at home. You know, it, the time is shortened and uh, it's, it's a good teamwork. So we have on the, uh, the uh, webcast right now, a group of experts. Uh, these patients aren't gonna all come to the big medical centers. And so the question is, uh, and one of the questions that we have are, you know, are we, you know, how do we train the members of the community to take care of these patients? Uh, should they just send them into the big medical center, or should we uh, uh, train patient, train teams uh, in the community to take care of them and keep them there? So, what do you think? Uh, so, uh, for for me, I like uh, uh, this idea. I, I definitely at, at this point. People, like you said, most people are, aren't seriously ill, and most people can get away even being at home. Once you know someone is, you know, even looking a little bit like they're getting sick, I, I would bring them in uh, sooner rather than later because once they get ventilated, they can deteriorate quickly. Uh, they may not need it, but 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 uh, but I, I, at this point, with where we are, so till we get experience, I still think it's a better idea to bring bring them into a to tertiary medical care center. Someone asks our our ultra protective ventilation strategies. If you're out in the community, you do have a ventilated patient three to four milliliters and plateau pressures being less than 30, the ARDSnet kind of criteria. Uh, are there new strategies? The, the, the most important one that, that uh, I think that we've started really realizing has helped and it looks around the, the world people have been going into is using proning. Proning does seem to help a, a significant number of people that did, did appear to improve initially some, some outcomes. So before we go to ECMO, that's something we didn't get to mention before, but we did attempt proning on our patient. and. And if you don't have an ECMO, that is something that, that may help you uh, avoid going it, getting ECMO itself for those who don't have that availability. Uh, so we do, we, do have, we do have Dr. Masood who will be joining us shortly, but, yeah. but I think you raise a very important point, yeah. which the solution to this is the solution to treating patients with COVID-19 is not just ECMO. Yeah. And in fact, lec ECMO should be the last resort among the last resorts, yeah. uh, and that the majority of these patients can be managed appropriately, it seems, through conventional uh, and lung protective uh, ventilatory strategies. So, so uh, before Gil leaves, I mean, questions that uh, we can direct uh, for Gil in terms of uh, equipment questions or. Uh, one, qu one question I do see up there, can we repurpose the bypass machines for ECMO? Uh, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, you can strip down, take off what you don't need on the circuit, on the, uh, on the heart-lung machine, and then just use the centrifugal head and whatever uh, safety intervention devices you have on there. So because, because even though now we have these specifically designed circuits, historically, that's what ECMO was. ECMO right. was essentially taking components from a traditional heart-lung machine, mm -hmm. including not just the tubing, but the membrane, right. and using it. I mean, the benefit of some of the membranes now is they last for days and weeks. Right. And so it may be that, that a hospital that doesn't have a lot of ECMO mm -hmm. equipment, but does do heart surgery, can mm -hmm. use that if it comes to that. They Absolutely. Can reconfigure it. Absolutely, it's a simple reconfigure, reconfiguration. Um, you're just taking out, as far as the circuit goes, you're just taking out the reservoir and creating a loop uh, with the membrane oxygenator uh, in line. Um, the only thing you need off of the heart-lung machine really is the driver and the centrifugal head just to uh, produce forward flow. But, so be uh, before Gil goes, mm -hmm. take advantage of Lena, Eddie, mm -hmm. and Gil's experience. 
So how do you keep the team safe? Uh, how, how do you prepare for and execute ECMO uh, cannulation initiation? That's something that is exceptionally important, I think, in, in terms of preparation. When we first did this, this was still at the beginning of the, uh, of the crisis, and people were just learning how to don and doff their gear, what, what equipment you really needed, how you needed to do it. There was some discussion about, and I know the, the criteria always seem like they're, they're changing pretty constantly about what protective equipment is required, but whatever you're going to do, practice it before you need it. Uh, we had an infectious disease specialist come in and show us how to put on our gear, uh, and we're still kind of changing that. We're, we're going to have training for our other surgeons who may be involved uh, in the near future as well in terms of how to put on the protective equipment. There's been discussion on, I know in, in Singapore they, they've been using the full PAPR systems to, to, uh, to in insert. The other recommendations from CDC and other places are that, that that's not required for people who are already ventilated where there's minimal risk of aerosol uh, generation. Uh, a thing I, I learned is putting on our, 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 our gowns and, and, uh, and our gloves and our, our face shields is that the, <laughs> the gown itself doesn't go down as far as you may need it if you have a, a blood, um, uh, a, 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 um, a Spit. procedure where blood may be, yeah. may, may be splashed. I actually had some on my scrubs. I ended up changing my scrubs in the ante room to take it off so I wouldn't be tracking blood across it. So using full boots for me, I realized also was, was helpful. So, so, so a couple of things. So, uh, and, and Lena, your thoughts on this. I mean, it's a bit of a sea change for us. I mean, usually when somebody has to go on ECMO emergently, <laughs> it's general quarters get sound, people rush to the yeah. bedside and just get into it and, and I think that the important thing for everybody to keep in mind is we have to protect our team first. Uh, take a minute to make sure that you're adequately protected. Uh, Lena, in, in terms of being at the bedside, and we're going to talk about virtual uh, care in a minute, but being at the bedside, what precautions uh, have you been taking? And uh, the proper PPE is very important, as Dr. Suarez said, you know, before we go in, we make sure we have our mask, our shield, our gown, um, double checking each other and make sure we put it properly before we enter the room. You know, uh, in the room, we, we um, have a plan um, who is doing what, so we were not doing a redundant stuff and minimize the people in the room will help a lot. And uh, communicating is a big, big thing, you know, um, um, speaking it out, what are you doing? And um, so that other um, coworker around you know what you're doing. If you're splashing blood, we need to know that as well. So this is a, um, um, a teamwork effort that we all work together. So there's a question that, uh, that's come in. If a patient's deteriorating uh, and escalating in ventilatory management, does it make sense to place uh, peripheral arterial and venous sheaths earlier rather than later in anticipation for the potential need of uh, ECMO. Because, uh, I mean, in addition to having to don and doff that equipment, yeah. it's harder to do the technical things yeah. Yeah. Uh, like getting wire access and uh, so wh what do you think about that, uh, Eddie? No, I mean, I think that's a good question, but personally, like, uh, it, it, I don't know if it would uh, take that much away from the risk of the procedure itself. I would say go with your routine of taking mm -hmm. care of patients who are sick. If so, if you would put an arterial line in someone who, who's deteriorating, put in your arterial line. In terms of assisting with the procedure itself, I definitely don't mind doing the stick myself. Sometimes I prefer it because I, I, I know exactly where it's gone in and how it's gone in and, and, uh, and makes it easier for me to know where I'm going to be putting the canya. So I, I don't mind doing that myself. Uh, if you would do it anyway, this is that, that's okay. We, we can use it. I don't think you need to do anything exceptional for these patients yeah. than you would otherwise. So before uh, Gil goes, Gil and Joe, I mean, one of the questions is, has, uh, have you or is there experience with repurposing the heart-lung machine so far or using operating room ventilators? Uh, anesthesia machines for taking care of these patients? Well, as far as repurposing the heart-lung machines, yeah, we've, uh, in the past, I have repurposed an S5 heart-lung machine. All that consisted of was taking the suckers off and just, leave, like I said, leaving the driver on and the centrifugal head on there. Uh, just basically breaking it down to the basics of a what you know. Any, any, uh, any tips or tricks about how frequently you should check that membrane? Because the membrane isn't designed to last as long as maybe right. some of the so, more conventional quadrox membranes. And actually, if you're, so if you did have to resort to using a, a heart uh, oxygenator designated for actual cardiopulmonary bypass, I would suggest checking that oxygenator at least 
up to four four hours a shift, four hours at a time. Uh, technically, those membranes are only good for up to six hours. Problem with using those oxygenators is plasma leakage. Yeah. So once the plasma leakage occurs, of course that interferes with your gas exchange abilities, and then you'll wind up changing these out frequently, depending on the patient. Thanks, Gil. Okay. So Eddie, uh, there's a question about uh, proning patients uh, as opposed to going on VV ECMO, and, and how about if somebody has a VAD? I mean, that's a, a pretty unique set of circumstances, may, hopefully. Yes, yeah, I mean, uh, proning versus VAD, in destination VAD, I, VAD, can you use VV ECMO in a VAD? Uh, you still could use VV ECMO in a VAD. And people uh, ask kind of peripheral, what type of strategies w we'd be using. If, if someone has a VAD, again, that's gonna be a very, very unique. The chance of someone with the VAD needing ECMO, that'll be like the smallest of the small, but I, I, would, I still think it's a, a option to use VV ECMO. It shouldn't be a contraindication if you need to. Uh, uh, proning, can you prone someone with a driveline? I don't know. <laughs> I, guess, I guess we'd find out. I'd still yeah. probably attempt that first. So we, we, we now have uh, Dr. Faisal Masood, uh, who is the chief of the Department of Critical Care here at uh, Houston Methodist. Uh, and he has been coordinating uh, the ICU uh, management, not only of the COVID patients in our hospital, but within our system. Good morning, Faisal. Uh, good uh, thanks morning. for joining us. Uh, good morning, Dr. Mulgravi. Thank you for inviting me. Um, I'm happy to participate with Dr. Suarez and everything. Can you, can you uh, touch on some of the strategies of ventilatory management of these COVID-19 patients and when those strategies start to fail and when we should consider uh, ECMO in these patients? So these COVID-19 patients, uh, one of the key things which has been learned so far in the last four months uh, from our Chinese colleagues and Italian colleagues and other places is okay. that uh, early intubation is considered source control. That means if somebody is requiring high amount of oxygen, you intubate them earlier on and you do not put them on BiPAP because you aerosolize so much and you contaminate so much and you don't really give a benefit to the patient. So early source control, early intubation. And another thing which we have found out is that Chest X-rays are not as sensitive or picking up early deterioration CT scans are. In fact, one of our patients we early intubated was only on four liters of oxygen, but his respiratory rate increased. And the CT scan was done, it is a classic ARDS, ARDS picture. So the patient was early intubated. Now, again, this is still, it causes inflammatory response. It is an ARDS picture, so you still have to follow the ARDS principle of low tidal volume, PEEP management, keeping the patient at best uh, neutral uh, because uh, what we are learning is keeping them very negative is causing a very high incidence of renal failure. So it's really a judicious combination of fluid management. And as we discussed in the previous is proning is still uh, if you are ready and if you've done that before, that's what you want to do. But if you have never done the proning before, I would seriously encourage you to practice on, on dummies or in simulation areas because it is a labor intensive and you don't want to learn on the patient. That is something. So prone is we are proning our patients before we go to an ECMO stage. However, uh, in our patient population, when we have proned them enough, uh, they deteriorate and do not go, uh, you know, to a, our path where we want them to go. So that's where our criteria for ECMO inclusion and exclusion kicks in. And that's a team-based decision and that's a, we've got multiple people involved because this is a decision which has to be very cautious, which has to be very mindful because a lot of resources are used, a lot of manpower, and there has to be not only an exact exit strategy, but a benefit to the patient, a very reasonable benefit. So these are not a patient you jump in to do those things. This has to be coordinated. And then we make a decision to put an ECMO on these patients, and we have done that. And again, it, uh, Dr. Suarez and we, we re-evaluated, we gave more chance to proning. So we don't rush, and I would encourage people not to rush in this thing. The one thing which the Italian colleagues told us, if you rush in this thing, not only you're not going to help the patient, but you're gonna you know, jeopardize the care. Five, key physicians in Italy have passed away, you know, yeah. you know, and all the things. So we have to, as previously mentioned. So Faisal, you bring up a very uh, timely topic. 
uh, we, uh, as well as other medical centers uh, across the country, have been exploring the use of the EICU or the virtual ICU. And, and what has been your experience uh, in using virtual ICUs in caring for these patients? What are the, what are the lessons that you've learned so far? And Lena, uh, uh, please give us your uh, thoughts and experiences with that as well. So part of the virtual ICU advantage is that uh, you are minimizing people to be actively present and keeping an eye on the patient. So not only you get a non-stop stream of data and analytics and trends, but you have a cameras and the cameras that we have, you can really examine the pupil size even. So you can have an aggressive team monitoring to manage the patient. You don't always have to go in to check everything. You can look at the pump if it is alarming. So we have deployed uh, our, our uh, EICU in our hospital and especially in these patients. And what we're doing is because these patients are on, in our medical ICU and our cardiovascular ICU are collaborating. And with the virtual ICU piece, we have what we call as a bridge consultant loop that we can get them a link and not only the bedside nurse, the ECMO specialist, but another physician, surgeon, pulmonologist, intensivist can actively co-manage them. You don't have to be all there. You don't have to gown. You don't have to break. So we're conserving resources, PPE, which is a very big deal, and we're protecting the people. Lena? So, yeah, so, so far as you make a good point, so historically, the care of ECMO patients in the ICU has been a very hands-on experience. I was very impressed with the use of the virtual ICU in how you can look at the cannulation sites, you can look at the drips, you can look at the monitors, you can look at the patient. So we're going from a hands-on to an eyes-on experience. Lena, has that been your experience? I mean, can you get the same kind of observation with virtual uh, ICU as you can with hands-on ICU? me as a ECMO specialist in the room and it, it is pretty clear where my intensivist uh, or the other doctors is outside the room they are watching their vitals and they are telling you that the patient is hypertensive the O2 set is dropping so they can intervene and give me orders outside the room and I think it's pretty effective like we're trying to limit all these doctors or all these people in the room so they will tell me to bolus medications you know sedate the patients more and all these necessary interventions that I needed. Um, I also have uh, tried it to look at the patients on the outside the room with the with the camera and it is very effective and you can actually zoom in all the way to the pump and actually look at what is the drips is running. You can zoom into the ventilator, zoom into the patients and you can communicate as well with the nurses in there. So not only does it protect the care team with the patient by limiting the number of care providers that need to be at the bedside, it can also act as a force multiplier. One of the questions that we have is, do you expect these patients to be in the tertiary care centers or around the community? The use of a virtual ICU care can expand. It, it really won't matter if the patients are in our ICU or even in our hospital. The ability of the experts to be able to use the virtual ICU model to care for those patients and help the, the providers at that hospital be uh, managing these patients. Uh, Faisal? So we are actually doing that. We're bringing our experts, uh, all kind of experts, whether that is neurologists, neuro uh, neurointensivists, neurospecialists, and cardiac, to the patient. So the goal is to bring all the expertise to the patient, not have the patient move everywhere around. Because not all community hospitals have that degree of expertise which any major medical center has. So our goal is how do we provide the top-notch care in our system to any patient who shows to any hospital and any ICU. And that is what the leverage of technology and monitoring and interaction. So we are men decide like our neuro uh, uh, surgeon, neurologist are deciding who's gonna get TPA, who's gonna get ELVO, our surgeons are making decisions, our intensive making decisions, hey, we can manage you, help you manage in the community. Not everybody has to transfer or, hey, ship this in very quickly. So this is the power of technology, which we're really harnessing 
A, force multiply, B, expertise to the patient, not the other way around. So one of the questions that have come in are training physicians in the community and non-CV surgeons. So, so Eddie, I mean, we, we obviously can't cannulate yeah. patients virtually. So, so what are your recommendations for cannulation strategies? What are the options and what do you recommend? So, so there obviously, uh, in terms of training, we, we have people out in the periphery who do already know how to, how to cannulate. Infectious uh, precautions and, and taking care of the people who are inserting, that will be the most important thing. People talked about thinking about how we're going to transfer these patients in. But the, for me, the most important thing, I, I do think peripheral, right now we, we like tend to prefer using uh, femoral, femoral, venovenous access. Other people you do use a uh, femoral and internal jugular access. Putting in something like a Protec or an Avalon, which people do have the expertise to do, requires a, a, a trip to the operating room, which puts a whole or CR, yeah. whole set of or CR, puts another set of people at risk. That that I'm not sure the benefit of that would uh, would outweigh the risk at, at this time, just because of the isolation needs required. So for me, my recommendation still is if you if you need to try to stay away from the OR as as if if you can. So you can maintain as much isolation and, and just do peripheral. Uh, so for the, for the for the folks with not as much experience as as uh, yeah. we have on the yeah. on the uh, on the webcast, so how do you prevent recirculation with your cannulation uh, strategy? I mean that's one of the concerns, right? About yeah, yeah. femoral femoral veno veno ECMO. So, yeah, that's one of the most common like uh, concerns here from people who aren't used to doing it. So w the way we we do it, and I think is for me is for me it's my gold standard is to put in a, mul a nice large multi stage cannula percutaneously percutaneously <laughs> uh, it, that sits somewhere in the uh, retrohepatic and inferior vena cava. You just basically measure it at bedside where you think it's going to fit in. The, uh, then we have a large single stage that goes into the right atria. Uh, our, st our standard is usually uh, either a 25 multi-stage French and a 21 single stage long cannula or a 21 multi-stage and a 19 depending on the uh, patient size. 21 uh, single stage. Outflow. Outflow. And 20. 20 oh, oh. And 19 inflow. Inflow, yes. Yeah. The larger one will be your, your uh, so the larger one will be the multi-stage draining the, the patient. The smaller one will be the one going back to the patient. I try to get the one going back to the patient into the heart. The nice thing about it, people don't realize, people think if the cannula position is off that, that you're going to recirculate into the multi-stage. The nice thing about those multi-stages is, is our, there's so many holes that we almost never see uh, a recirculation. Right now, our patient has our, our single stage that's actually a little bit lower below the tip of the multi-stage. You think there'd be recirculation. We, were, we, take, we took a venous gas from the multi-stage and a venous gas from somewhere in, in mm. the uh, internal jugular to, to check to see if there really is a, a differential caused by recirculation. They're pretty much the same. We, we got a 74% in the, uh, in the multi-stage and a 76%, I think, in, in the... Uh, so what, what, uh, for, the, for the folks listening, what kind of imaging do you need in order to cannulate? You don't need any imaging is a nice thing for multi-stage. You just need to do peripheral and, and guide it. Afterwards, we do an abdominal x-ray to, to check where the position to cannulate is. But the most important thing is the clinical result. When you put it in, I'm sure people know who do ECMO, you turn on the ECMO. Once your cannulas are in, you're connected to ECMO circuit, you turn it on. If their oxygen saturation goes from 80% to 100%, you know it's working. You can try to adjust it by the x-rays, but you, you're, you're worried about the outcome. So if it's helping them oxygenate and come down on the heart lung and on the uh, ventilator, then, then it's doing its job, and that's what you go by. So Eddie and Faisal, so, so the, the mainstay or the frontline ECMO strategy should be VV ECMO, yes? So there, is, um, there are quite a few patients, especially uh, there's a high incidence of uh, acute myocarditis and cardiomyopathy acutely, and which has led to quite a bit number of patients of getting on VA ECMO versus VV. And uh, one of the top three causes of death in these patients is cardiac, you know, ventricular right. arrhythmia or cardiogenic failure. So in those patients, um, you know, VV is gonna be utilized most, but you have to be mentally ready to uh, assess, to put a VECMO, and the determining factor would be what is the inotropic or vasopressor support it is, and that's where the role of non-invasive technology, whether it is Vigilio, whether it's bed cell ultrasound is gonna key role, yeah. because if you are scrubbing in and you are on three inotropic repressors, VECMO may not be the best option. Do an ultrasound and evaluate and maybe uh, VA ECMO be a choice, so a so control th decision. This brings up a important point. One is a, is triaging. 
So, so even though that is a common problem in some of the patients, th this myocardial involvement, that's also a marker of high risk of not surviving. Is, is that, that's been the experience so far around the world. Yes, so the, uh, the challenge we've all faced is that there's such a limited number of patients in ECMO that two or three patients in this pool or that pool can skew the results. Uh, and I will take a step back on that is, before you even make a decision ECMO, the patient should have fulfilled your institutional guidelines on who should get an ECMO. And then you stratify that whether I'm doing at the end of the curve or I'm doing at the beginning of the curve. If you're at the end of the curve, no matter what strategy you will do, you will be uh, not successful. And if you do in the beginning curve, that may make a difference. Now, mind you, uh, what we have learned from our colleagues is, on the average, these patients are on the ECMO 15 to 20 days. Yeah. So you can imagine the resources, the trajectory, and how much manpower it is need to maintain that one patient versus 20 other patients who may be so. It is a very ethical and, and, and medical decision has to be made. So, so inclusion and exclusion criteria, I don't think that there are any hard and fast, but, but I think each institution would be well served by creating those prospectively. Yeah. If you haven't done those, I do think you, I mean, obviously uh, most ECMO programs do already have their inclusion exclusion criteria. If you haven't, you, sh you should set, set them up. Um, but for the most part, I think we, we, we know how to, how to put in ECMO and, and who to put it in. The only changes with, with COVID, like we talked about, are the age and use of proning before. Th I would use the same criteria you use for anyone else in terms of putting in VV ECMO and VA ECMO. That's, that's my my personal yeah. view right now. So the, the variable is, uh, it's the surge factor, which is, yeah. um, you know, how many patients you can put in ECMO, yeah. what is your resource. So, in, and remember in what we cannot forget it, we still have cardiac patients. We still have patients who are going to shock. We still have heart failure patients. Right. So you cannot, we, you know, you have to compare the numbers of COVID positive patient to the rest of the other patient population, which still we had a, we had to do an emergency bypass, urgent bypass yesterday because the patient was unwell. We, we can't be a tunnel vision. We still have to focus on an em emerging threat, but we still have a bigger pool of patients which we are bound to serve. So you have to weigh the number of equipment machines you can do versus the other. You can't do a bypass surgery on a ventilator. You gotta have some bypass machine. So, so that's Faisal, it. So, so one of the ways to conserve or preserve ECMO circuits is to appropriately manage these patients on the ventilator. So you're an expert on ventilator management. Can you, can you tell the folks watching what the ultra protective strategy should be and how to manage these patients on ec uh, not on ECMO, not but on the ventilator. So as I mentioned, early intubation, early use of paralytics, uh, you know, keeping the patient even, uh, you know, anywhere from four ml to six ml per kilo on the tidal volume issue, maintaining the PK wave pressures. I think, you know, the plateau and everything less than 30 are a key factor. And early use, if you have not done that, I would encourage you to have your team practice how to do early proning. That in the last two years have shown to be very beneficial. And I would encourage people seriously evaluating and doing proning before doing at least VV ECMO, you know, not the yeah. VA piece wise. So, so the basic core principle necessarily have not changed. Yeah. Uh, the role of steroids is still questionable. If your patient is septic shock, then you can, but not always. Hey, Lena, have you had much experience with proning patients? And can you give us the benefit of your experience? Uh, no, because in CV ICU, we do not do proning in um, CV. So mainly proning procedure is done by medical ICU at this point. Okay. And this patient, there was, because this patient was located uh, are in medical ICU, so because medical ICU team is very well trained and they do it, so they did prone this patient. Okay. And they did a very, and that's where Dr. Soar is ready and we kind of look back and forth. We gave them more time to prone, in fact. They say, okay, let's give it more time before we do that. Does, so, does, does the ICU need any special equipment to prone the patient or do they just need strong arms and strong backs? Uh, uh, I think the most important thing is, uh, is coordination of the team. There is quite a bit of equipment required and preparation before you do on a live patient. 
our critical care symposium have wor has workshop about proning we have our own team have created youtube uh, videos and everything for proning i would strongly encourage that it is very doable and but you need to do it beforehand you don't need any special company there are commercial projects uh, beds which can actually prone that also but you know those are extremely expensive yeah. equipment so if you don't have the choice that may be an option but it is still very expensive joe how about um, in the community what uh, kind of preparations and precautions are you recommending for the teams in the community with regard to ecmo Yes, sir. Great question. And I, I really appreciated the comment uh, that was just made regarding managing patients uh, that have primary cardiac disease and if we have the resources available for them. Our most important thing right now is keeping our, uh, our team safe. If we have a suspected COVID case, we make sure that we're using the M95 filters, uh, all of the uh, recommended personal protective equipment uh, and treating everyone as if they are infected until otherwise proven uh, different um, if, if it is proven that way but we still have to manage our typical heart patients so as far as our resources are concerned we have teams of people that are specifically segmented or specifically dedicated to specific institutions so that we don't have people going from one institution to the other institution who may in fact themselves be infected. Uh, now, has that already happened for other folks? Probably so, but it hasn't, uh, we're trying to limit our uh, uh, participation in that. Uh, however, again, like everybody else, we have only so many resources. If you look at the oxygenators, which we were talking about earlier, um, and Italy, not too long ago, had an earthquake. Now they have this and many of the uh, tools that we use are in fact manufactured here. That can also happen in some other countries where our oxygenators are coming from. Germany, for example, with the uh, quadrons. So there are New Jersey, here in New York. So as the workforce is pulled back, um, the availability of resources becomes very complicated. Yeah. And I think yeah. also it's important to understand that not every hospital provides ECMO support. So repurposing heart lung machines, repurposing oxygenators that are intended for bypass surgery that may be more thrombogenic um, for these ECMO patients could be a problem because if we can't take care of the, the, the regular cardiac patients. That, that's great, Joe. You, you raise a good point that uh, although uh, we know that, that uh, COVID-19 affects all ages, it, it, it does seem as if patients who have pre-existing cardiac disease uh, and pre-existing cardiac risk factors are at higher risk for contracting and, and having complications and increased death uh, from getting infected. And, and a quite, we've got a bunch of questions. So Faisal, uh, what about should hospitals be cohorting these patients uh, or having them uh, have, go to just the ICU that they have? So uh, the, uh, as the escalation of cases come in, what the best strategy which we have done and along with other institutions is to cohort in a defined location because A, you minimize the uh, equipment, you have expertise of nursing and doctors, you are really minimizing the spread in other areas and you still have other patients to take care of. Now that is for COVID positive patient. What we are seeing Right now, uh, a threefold is the patient under investigation or suspected COVID. And that is that, you know, just because you're suspected COVID doesn't mean that you are COVID and that is have to be thought through. You still have to do your basic PPE on all of those patients. But we are keeping those suspected patients into their home unit. If they turn positive, we transfer to our dedicated unit. Mm -hmm. Then the focus Methodist has been a very proactive in the heart center is developing our own testing for COVID. So we, and, uh, yes, so, so that. So, so we, have, we, we have a couple of questions and this I'm gonna put you on the spot, Faisal. Okay. Not, not only are ECMO and ventilators limited resources, but right now PPEs like masks and face shields are limited resources. So just a practical question that's come in and, and Lena, please join in. Going from patient to patient, are you changing 
your PPEs or are you keeping the same PPEs on? So the, when you talk to infection disease specialists and an infection controller and across the country, it's really about aerosolization. So if a patient is intubated and, uh, you know, and you clean the area, then you're not aerosolizing. If the patient has a high flow mass, then there is a high risk for aerosolization. If you just intubated that patient, then you have a high risk of aerosolization. If you just extubated the patient, then you're high risk for aerosolization. Beyond that, there is no uh, very limited aerosolization. And when you put on the, your, your N95 or even surgical mask, in, because N95 have become a, a, a scarce resource, you are very well protected with PEP equipment and everything. The core principle of PPE do not change whether it is a TB patient or COVID-19 patient. Yeah. It's really about aerosolization and the risk of aerosolization, and you should be focusing on protecting yourself. What do you think, Lena? What's your experience? Um, at this point, we are in medical ICU. Um, we are using um, one N95 mask per patient, and um, from doing it five times per mask, we are now limit, uh, limited to one mask per shift. Yeah. So we're using the same N95 mask for the same patient throughout the whole shift. Desperate times call for desperate measures, I guess. Eddie, in Faisal, if a hospital runs out of ventilators, should we go straight to ECMO? That's a question that we've been asked. So uh, the odds of running out of yeah. ventilator versus ECMO machine, you will going to run out of ECMO machine before you will ever run out of ventilators. You think so? It, huh? You, you think so? I was, I was curious about that. Uh, because, so because on the average, if you look at them in uh, institutions, uh, except yeah. for institutions who do 150 ECMOs a year, most institutions have capabilities of doing uh, 8 to 12 yeah. ECMOs, and then you include the pump yeah. machines, you add 10, 12, so you will potentially have 20 patients on ECMO in theory on the average, 2025. Perhaps, perhaps a better strategy than going straight to ECMO would be utilizing your anesthesia machines as ventilators yes. first. Because I, I mean, I think that probably most hospitals uh, have more anesthesia machines than, than ECMO they have ECMO circuits. And I, in fact, uh, there are, uh, if you look at it, you know, human, you know, doctors are very innovative people and, and they have created circuits who can ventilate two patients with one ventilator. Uh, how valid that is, we don't know, but that has been tried. Uh, but there is a, it does come to, at some stage in Italy and China, it has come to a philosophical situation, an ethical moral decision, that when you have a huge surge, you can't maintain them, who should go on the ventilator, who should not. The advantage is, in this country right now, in the U.S., we know all of these things, and that's with the government and everything to expedite the well, equipment. We, we touched on this earlier, but perhaps it's important to reiterate it, Eddie. Uh, that is, what has been the success rate with the use of ECMO for COVID-19 around the country and around the world? Because I, 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 it would be a mistake, I think, for us to finish up the broadcast with everybody thinking patients that go on ECMO will do well those who are not offered ECMO will not do well. So can you address that, Eddie? The, I mean, the, the, the uh, experience is still limited. Like Dr. Masood said, there are just small numbers that can, that can warp the, uh, w what the perceived outcome. There, there are some uh, uh, publications from China where they had six patients and five of them passed away. But if you talk to people around, around the world, there are people who have a much higher success rate, people who have like six patients and five of them are off now. One of, I mean, if you were still continuing on, on ECMO, and improving. Overall, I think we still have to go with our experience of ECMO in viral pneumonias and viral like lung injuries, which is actually a good so is it, mean, so overall is, good Is the success so a, a reflection of ECMO or the or what was used as the indications or the threshold to go on ECMO? So two things. Uh, we were running 12 ECMOs in our H1N1 flu and we had a very good experience with that and our we had a very good survival rates from those patients. Uh, now, uh, it was a little bit slightly skewed to current patient because those are relatively a little bit more younger patient population, but that is as close as anybody in the world has is with H1N1 flu when so much ECMOs were being used. Uh, with that being said, uh, I think uh, limited evidence is out there. Uh, as I already mentioned, inclusion, inclusion is very crucial. 
if you have capabilities, I can assure you, you will end up using it. Uh, In that experience, uh, Faisal, how many of those patients that were successfully weaned and decannulated in the H1N1 experience had single organ disease as opposed to multi-organ uh, dysfunction? So there, so the comparison is probably uh, twi twice as much in the H1N1 had single organ disease. Uh, and in this patient populations, you know, what we're seeing and what our colleagues are seeing across the country, there are a lot of comorbidities. And that's where inclusion exclusion criteria will have to play a role. If these are hard decisions, but yeah. they have to be thought through. What everybody will tell you across is that do not jump into the room, as Dr. Mulgari mentioned, in a warm mentality. You are not going to not help the patient, but then you have eight patients you've exposed and then remind you, if you expose this patient, those eight providers have to be taken off service. So, the, you know, what is the benefit to other patients mindful of that? We have another question about how do we protect our <laughs> cardiac patients con from contracting COVID-19 within a hospital system? Uh, and what's the role of a, of a cardiac surgeon uh, for COVID-19? Eddie? If in terms of a cardiac surgeon, we're the experts in, in cannulation. So being prepared uh, and learning how to actually protect yourself if you're called to put in ECMO is the most important thing. And, and that's something I'd want to really be prepared of and learn how to put it in, how to protect yourself before you're act, asked to do that. So, so I, in one of the experiences from around the world is that where we really have to de-differentiate ourselves in that we as cardiac surgeons are used to taking care of cardiac surgery patients. Yeah. But we're, we're physicians, we're surgeons, we're cardiac surgeons, we're intensivists. Yeah. And so we may need to dust off some of those skill sets that we have developed along our training Absolutely. Uh, and put them to good use in taking care of patients that are either on the ward uh, or in the ICU and help with ventilation uh, management in addition to cannulating uh, and decannulating. Absolutely. Lena, Absolutely. What, what lessons have, have you learned that you can share with uh, those listening? Um, I, from the, the experience where we cannulations, I think teamwork is a big key effort, you know, uh, working together, uh, communications, you know, limiting people in the room, and this is all the big factors that we needed to learn um, so that we can keep everyone safe. Thank you. There's, there's another question that's come in. Uh, are there experiences in lung transplantation for this cohort? Uh, I think there's only one case report I'm aware of from China of a patient getting a double lung transplant post-COVID. Uh, I don't believe that there's any other uh, published at least of in this country or in Italy of uh, lung transplantation. So, uh, you know, the American College of Surgeons and the Surgeon General and now uh, many of the governors and states around the country have uh, not only recommended but have insisted on canceling elective cases. Uh, from a cardiac surgery point of view, we have very few elective cases. We have emerging cases and we have urgent cases. Uh, the Society of Thoracic Surgeons has recommended using essential and non-essential cases. What, what are your thoughts, Eddie, about? Uh, I think your recommendations were excellent. There are some patients who we know, the stable angina patient who has uh, something that's revascularizable, if they can wait, obviously being waiting, but, but as you've mentioned, and you've made a great job in the leadership of this as well, being able to kind of triage the patients who, who do need and don't need it talk, um, in your hospital, you know, in your systems, talk about who you're going to do, who you're not going to do, so you're prepared and you're all in agreement about what to do moving forward. Yeah, no, no, uh, no question. I think that uh, patients with chronic stable angina or, 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 or uh, uh, cardiac illnesses that would benefit from cardiac surgery but don't necessarily need it today or this week or this month may be and should be better served at home. Uh, we do have to take care of the patients who come in with emergencies like dissections, acute coronary syndromes, uh, patients who come in with heart failure and endocarditis. The more resources we use to take care of non-essential patients, the fewer resources we'll have to take care of these patients, uh, the COVID-19 patients, and the emergency patients that we that we uh, that we have to deal uh, take care of. So, uh, Faisal, how about limiting um, the uh, number of tests that we we do? There's no 
in this day and age, there's no shortage of tests that we order, that we get. Uh, any thoughts or advice of, of how to focus our resources? So I think uh, we do have um, technology like Vigilio and in which you can get your cardiac output and everything. You don't always have to get an echo. Uh, the number of blood work, uh, you know, everything is being re everything is being revised. Nothing is what was okay uh, one month ago is okay right now. And and pretty much all the all our major academic medical center are learning on the job. So we are learning on the job just like everybody else. Our biggest, I think, the the premise of this question is to minimize exposure to the healthcare worker in the room. So there should be no routine echo, there should be no routine blood work, which was by default based on order sets. We have to rethink our order set business and kind of make it patient-centered, patient-specific, because one has to look at it every time you have a, pay, a healthcare worker who may not, these are the people who are doing blood work are not physicians or expertise or doing echo. You have to protect them. You have to be mindful is what do you want that result to help you guide? So I think that thoughtful process plus use of technology like virtualize you looking at all of those things is has already limited and, by, and basic awareness. So what was normal two months ago is no more normal. Yeah. We are but redefining. I think that's a, you bring up a very good point, Faisal. I remember back uh, in our residency days, there was an expression that uh, if you're worried about a patient, don't worry alone, get other people involved. I think as we move forward, we should change that to don't learn alone. As we learn how to take care of these patients, it's very, very important to share it, not only with your colleagues within your institution, but also around the country and around the world we should really take advantage of the experience in China, in Italy, in Europe, uh, to, to learn together. Well, this, this has been a very informative and educational uh, webcast. I want to thank uh, everyone who's been involved here in the studio, uh, those in the virtual studio. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, Lena. And, wow. and to those of you watching, thank you very much for your, uh, for your interest. Thank you very much for your questions. Uh, and as we move forward, uh, we plan on using the DeBakey uh, CV uh, Surgery Live to broadcast more important, informative, and educational programming. So until next time, uh, thank you very much. Uh, be safe and uh, good luck in taking care with the patients. Thank you. Thank yeah, you. Thanks. So we uh, want to continue to.